Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time with a massive archive of videos for you to enjoy, plus two new videos every week and a weekend live stream where you can hang out with me and talk about the world of role playing games. This week, with the announcement of our second Magic the Gathering crossover sourcebook for 5th edition D&D, officially I have had a backer request to talk about the Leonin and I am more than happy to do so since I think they are awesome and I can't wait to play them as characters myself and I know that many of my friends want to play them so I'm looking forward to how they portray them at the table. But as I was researching this video I realised it's probably better to start looking at the world of Theros itself before talking about one specific race of intelligent beings who live there. So first, before we get to the Leonin, which I'll cover in a future video, what is the new location from the Magic the Gathering multiverse? What is this Theros place? I'll sum it up as best I can in a very brief overview, just broad strokes so you get the general idea. Cosmologically, starting with the way this dimension is arranged with its own mythology, there is the world of Theros. Above that is the land of night and dreams called Nyx. This is where people go when they sleep. It's the domain of the gods. It's also a unique characteristics of their gods, their powers and the creatures who serve them, that their shadows look like a fabulous nighttime starlit sky. Divine power is literally spectacular in Theros. There's no doubt about it. It's lit. The gods are not exactly like the gods of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. They are actually an extremely powerful form of living enchantment. And in turn, they are sort of the source of magical power for the mortal beings of Theros. All mortals believe that all enchantments are a gift from the gods. So they would just give you a funny look if you started talking about divine versus arcane magic. They don't see them as different per se. There is, uh, this is really a refreshing perspective on magic and theology in the game that I find particularly exciting to explore and I'm looking forward to how they handle that in Theros. On Theros, it's possible to look up at the nighttime sky and see an image of one of the gods gazing down on the mortal world from their own spiritual realm. Much as is depicted in Greek myth and legend, the gods up on high looking down into the world as though the mortals are pawns in an elaborate game that they play. Theros was deliberately designed from the top down in this way. So if you watch movies like The Clash of the Titans, Wrath of the Titans, Immortals, Jason and the Argonauts, Hercules, even Wonder Woman, this is exactly what this world setting is all about. This is where you tell those stories and you make new ones of your own. So look out for common themes such as a hero being blessed by the gods, given incredible artifacts to use on an epic quest, or risking being turned into a monster by the will of a spiteful and fickle deity, who once they do that are very unlikely to ever unmake the changes that they've made. The heroes may also cover, curry the favour of the gods through tributes and extraordinary devotion. Also a theme seen time and again is that of a character who lives on the mortal world but is actually a demigod, the result of a tryst between a god and a mortal. This is a pretty strong element of Greek mythology. Even historic accounts will attribute divine lineage to historic figures who accomplished extraordinary deeds. So they sort of tack on a divine lineage to beings who just did things which are too extraordinary for ordinary people to aspire to. The mortals and the gods are more closely related in Theros than is the assumed norm in 5th edition D&D settings, so they interact more. The countless stories and the faiths of the people of this world have created a pantheon of gods that are very representative of all the important aspects of Theron life. They are very much modelled after the Greek pantheon, so they have similar moods and behaviours to mortal rulers. They exact direct divine intervention and retribution to the people of the world. For example, the legend has it that the sun god Heliod smote a city from the world by hurling a powerful sun spear named Crusor directly at the city of Arixmenthes, casting it into the sea, so he blasted it off the face of the planet. Um, it is certainly a theme common to the gods of Theros that they have signature weapons of mighty power, hammers and whips and things. The god of the sea is called Thassa, and like all the gods, she holds many domains presiding over the oceans, its secrets, its people, such as the native Triton race. There's also knowledge, murmurs, gradual change, introspection, vast distances, long voyages, and far-ranging searches. So more like a god of currents, pa patterns, the flow and passage of time, rather than just a god of the waters. Erebos is the god of the underworld. Now, the underworld of the Theros dimension is not hell. It's a realm where all living beings of Theros travel to after they die. So it encompasses the many different regions, much like the great wheel of the outer, outer planes of the D&D multiverse, represent all the different combinations of alignment and moral or ethical outlook of the souls who pass on. Erebos 
has its origin story um an origin well the god Erebos has an origin story a little bit like the dualistic nature of the goddesses Seiluni and Shar in the world of Toril of the Forgotten Realms D&D setting. When the sun first shone on Heliod, god of the sun, the first shadow was cast and when Heliod saw it he feared it and banished it with his divine power sending it beyond the so-called rivers that ring the world and the, the five rivers that form a boundary between Theros and its underworld again along the same lines as the river Styx and Oceanus to form a medium between the realms of uh, Greek mythology. The shadow became Erebos, the god of death, and in time Erebos accepted his role, knowing that although Heliod had banished him, he would always stand behind the sun god. Erebos has dominion over death and the underworld, of course, as well as misfortune, ill fate, envy, bitterness, and a begrudging acceptance of duty or fate. He's also the Theron god of wealth, because in the end, wealth has no real value. The underworld of Theros lacks both sunlight and starlight because the starlight comes from the realm of Nyx. So a little history of the world in a nutshell. We have an ancient prehistory where primal titans lurched and thundered around the world. They were, were horrific primal urges made flesh and blood and were basically unchecked and terrifying. The mortals existing on this world as best they could were powerless to defend themselves so turned to prayer in their hour of need and from this intense prayer this concentrated devotion sprang the gods themselves. Imbued with incredible power by the faith of the mortals, the gods sealed the titans away in the underworld. Clothis, the god of fate, volunteered to act as jailer and sequestered herself in the underworld for eternity. While Erebos rules this realm beyond death, it was Clothis who acted as an internal seal, ensuring the titans remained trapped. So very much like Greek mythology. Skipping ahead... We come to the end next era where the servants of law and order, the divine archons, de uh, decided to take over the world of Theros and rule it with a squeaky clean but iron fist. And the local mortals were mostly not very happy about it because the archons went way overboard on the lawful side of lawful good. Helping them to enforce their will on the people were a lion humanoid race called the Leonin who are, well, they, they're honourable and fierce, and thought that since the Archons were part of the forces of law and order in the multiverse, they were clearly on the right side of things, and all the complaints from the other mortal races was just a bunch of whining because they were naughty little rascals who kept expecting to get let off the hook for all their naughtiness. Well, the Leonin were turning a blind eye to a lot of pain and suffering that the other mortal races were going through for real, and got, they got so bad that the mortals did the only thing left of them. They prayed to the ancient gods who had sealed away the dreaded titans and were just sort of lazing about around and soaking up their worship. And the first time they feared for their very existence, they prayed hard, and that kind of desperate prayers resonate in the great beyond and hey presto they actually managed to get the gods to p take pity on them and grant them the power to take back their freedom now we zoom into the location i think we'll get the most focus in this new source book the former empire of the immortal archons named Agnomakos. For generations he used his Leonin army to carve out his empire of strict tyrannical rule until one day two humans two soldiers Canaeus and Tiro, joined by their love for one another and for freedom, rose to challenge him. The people rallied to their cause and Agnomachus was defeated. Canaeus and Tiro are based on the Athenian lovers from history, Harmodius and Aristogaton, known as the Tyrannocides, who assassinated the Athenian tyrant Hipparchus in 514 BC. The legend says that uh, the legend on Theros says that the god Epara granted humans magic to help them overthrow the Archon and cast out his Leonin guard. And the humans then created four great polis or city states. And the one the two lovers were from is called Miletus. And I think that's where the source book will focus its attention. I could be wrong. The other polis are Akros, carved into a mountain and home to the most fierce warriors on the planet, dedicated to bringing safety and justice to the world beyond their mountain. Uh, the imposing clifftop fortress of Arcros lies at the center of a network of outposts that serve to protect the rest of Theros, very much like the signal fires between Gondor and Rohan in the Lord of the Rings, but a lot more active. Arcros is essentially Sparta, so it's a reenactment of it's, it's a fantasy version of Sparta. The current rulers are King Anax and Queen Symede. Notable landmarks are the massive stone structure leading into Akros called the Faragax Bridge and the many tiers of the central fortress called the Colophon, home to the royals. And there is this uh, the place called, called One-Eyed Pass, home to a crapload of cyclops. And the 
Phoberos Badlands occupied by marauding Leonin flesh-eating minotaurs and fire-breathing dragons. Because this is D&D, there has to be dragons. But... Being what we call points of light world setting, the population is relatively small and there are only three polays left. The next is the green lands of Setessa. Setessa is an isolated polis surrounded by concentric rings of forest. It's fiercely independent and its inhabitants form very strong bonds with each other and their deep connection to the veneration of nature. Setessa is directly inspired by Wonder Woman's home of Themyscira, laid out like the rings of a tree which radiate outward from the central temporal of Kara Metra. Family dwellings and city structures blend into the forest with pathways not wide enough for a cart and many treetop rope bridges, so it's mostly people on foot and riding on animals. The polis blends smoothly with the Nistros forest on the one side and the open Chaparral on the other. And Thousa leads Kara Metra Temple's Council of Warriors, She's considered to be in commune with the gods and is the de facto ruler of the city. Other notable features are the Amatrophon, like a zoo on drugs, basically a bazaar of different exotic animals at the edge of the Setessa. There are four watchtowers named after the lion, the serpent, the fox and the falcon, and they've got a royal guard um, who are dedicated to those animals as well. There are numerous sacred groves, a large open market called the Abora market and these mystical nexus sites that form an enchanted effect called the Kalima Vale that looks like a misty star field that flows across the land. The place has enough nature rituals and festivals to make a wood elf envious. Finally there is Miletus, uh, modelled on ancient Athens, a polis of learning, progress, magic and devotion to the gods. It's very much the Greek ideal, a testament to the achievements of civilized humanity populated by progressive thinkers, pious thaumaturges and wise oracles on the coast of the Triton populated Siren Sea, with a network of branches of the Kea River splayed out across vast wheat fields and bringing in fresh water and trade from distant villages. The harbour to the Triton uh, populated Siren Sea is uh, like a ring with the two great statues of the heroes that freed them from slavery. Miletus was born from the defeat of tyranny and to this day it retains a spirit of the triumph of free thought over brutish force. Miletans pride themselves on their great temples to the gods, their thaumaturgical academy, great works of architecture such as the legendary Decatur Academy of Mages and Philosophers and their reverent army. The Twelve, a council of philosophers headed by Paris Sophia, serves as the ruling body of Miletus. As mentioned, there are other plays, but they are no more. Smote by the gods like um, Aram uh, Araxmenthes and Olantis, and there is Olantis, basically, that's Atlantis. And there are many small plays, some of humans, some not, such as the Necropolises of Aspidel and Odunus, which is, uh, they house great numbers of undead and the Minotaur polis of Skophos, with its many temples to the god of slaughter. Beyond these bastions of civilization, or savagery, Theros is a world of mystery, magic, and monsters. It's a plain where barbaric, cave-dwelling minotaurs descend on wayward travelers, giants stalk the land, drawing strength from the terrain on which they tread, at sea massive krakens prowl its depths, and sirens lure sailors to their demise. Also, the Archons are still out there, bitter and seething at the injustice and dishonor they feel was done to them by the ungrateful mortals who overthrew them. Satyrs, centaurs, dryads, minotaurs, cyclops, giants, beasts, hydras, serpents, dragons, gorgons, merfolk, basilisks, chimeras, harpies, hags, lamias, pegasi, phoenixes, uh, sphinxes, sirens, and manticores, all the wondrous forms of the returned and corrupted dead so spirits demons ghosts zombies the stage is set the shields and spears swords and helms are buffed and ready there is a lot of wild world beyond the city walls and plenty going on inside those polices as well i have to say i'm really looking forward to this source book i grew up on a diet of greek legends so a lot of D, &D flavor mixed in which elevates it all even further into the fantastic and i'm curious how the cosmology will affect things like background stories for mages and clerics paladins and warlocks imagine the sort of a sun soul warlock whose patron is actually one of the deposed archons bad guy celestials lovely I'll be following up soon with a video on the Leonin and another look at the Satyr and other intelligent races. The Leonin are particularly interesting because there are no tales of lion people in ancient Greek myth of course, so that's all D&D. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise where you'll geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.